I will, there's no particular order. I will just perhaps ask a few people to say, I think maybe Leah, if you want to start, that'd be okay. Yeah. All right. Let's sure. See. Yeah, I'm happy to start. So in 1942, Heidegger gave a lecture course on Holderlin's hymn, The Ister. The Ister refers, referred to is an archaic name for the river Danube, which runs from the uh, Southern Germany to the Black Sea. And um, for anyone who hasn't seen it, there's a really great documentary film entitled The Ister about Heidegger. So recommendation in there. So this lecture course touches on a number of themes we've discussed in this course, including language, uh, translation, poetry, and in particular, the relationship between familiar and the foreign, or what we might call the homely and the unhomely. Something that is quite interesting about this lecture course, and is certainly not unique to it, is that it does not merely tell about the homely and the unhomely, it enacts a journey from the familiar to the foreign. So it begins a discussion with Holderlin's river poems, which would be quite familiar um, to Heidegger's audience, and then leaps back 2000 years to the poetry of ancient Greek tragedy, specifically Sophocles' Antigone. And then in the final section, it returns uh, to Holderlin. So given the brevity of this talk, um, I'm gonna not really look at Holderlin at all and focus on what Heidegger has to say about Antigone. So is everyone familiar with Sophocles' Antigone? Like the, the general story? I mean, who free to no, say if you want to? Okay. Um, so Antigone um, is a play by Sophocles. Um, uh, in it's so Antigone is a female character who is the daughter of Oedipus through incest. Um, now Antigone has a sister and two brothers. The two brothers kill each other in battle, um, and the one is given a proper state funeral, and the other is left out uh, for the carrion. And um, so there's this edict passed by the new king of Thebes, um, Creon, Antigone's uncle, that no one should bury Polynices, the second brother who is not given a state funeral. But Antigone buries him anyway. Um, so the play uh, shows her kind of making this decision, uh, going through with it, although actually it happens off stage. Um, and then she has to sort of um, face the consequences of her action, which ends up being uh, buried alive in a tomb. And um, it's a tragedy, so um, it's got a pretty sad ending, but I won't spoil it. So in Heidegger's discussion of Antigone, he suggests that the title character, Antigone, is Igenslik Unheimlich, which in my English translation, which I have here, is re rendered properly unhomely. So the first term here, Igenslik, um, we've discussed in the past weeks, um, can be translated to authentic or owned. Um, and of course, this language harkens back to being in time in which Iglentiklikheit um, is typically translated um, as authenticity is, is a key term. The second term here, uh, Unheimlich, uh, kind of poses, I think, an even greater challenge to translation. Uh, to my understanding, and I'm certainly not a German speaker, uh, the word Unheimlich is used in the vernacular to describe something uncanny, weird, unnerving, or spooky. Uh, it's, it's taken up by a number of psychologists and philosophers, notably Freud. Um, so while Heidegger certainly wants to convey this sort of mooted element, um, that Unheimlich presents a sort of uncomfortable or um, anxious mood, um, I take it to be quite significant that Unheimlich contains the word for home. So something that is unheimlich is unhomely or not at home. For Heidegger, this is a term that describes the human condition um, or rather the condition of Dasein. Uh, we are not at home. We are exposed to nature and aware of this exposure and we can name the things around us and thereby bring them into a presenting. Unlike mountains or flowers or ocean tides, we're not 
and this is this is my own phrasing, sort of sunk into being or into fusis. We are the opening, and we're the beings for which being is the question. Being is a question. So to say that Antigone is properly unhomely is to say that she has fully embraced the human condition. She has, as Heidegger describes, oh, lost my spot. She has, as Heidegger describes, made her home in the unhomely. And to make this point, Heidegger refers to line 95 and 96 of the play, in which Antigone expresses her intent to uh, pation to dine on, that is, um, to take up into her own essence the uncanny that stands before her. Here, Heidegger interprets dine on as roughly synonymous with unhomely, as he uses it. Dine on conveys this sort of simultaneous gift curse um, of Dasein's unique standing apart from nature. So the verb in this line, pation, gives us, I think, a new perspective on what it means to own oneself. Uh, pation for Heidegger is a kind of active re receptivity that resists a subject object binary. We might describe it as a suffering that recognizes and chooses itself. As Heidegger, Heidegger describes, uh, pation is a taking upon oneself, a making it through to the end that is properly experiencing. For Heidegger, Antigone owns herself precisely because she lovingly embraces this uncanny fate that is her own. Now, there's been a number of different commentators who've sought to flesh out in detail uh, what precisely unhomeliness or uh, the dine-on is and how exactly it pertains to Antigone's actions in the play, i.e. burying her brother. Um, however, shockingly, these commentators, um, likely in order to distance Heidegger's middle work, um, from his early work, neglect the significance of death. So they tend to be very hesitant to associate uh, Antigone with anticipatory resoluteness as in being in time, at least, at least on, in the reading that I've done. But here I wanna suggest that death is really the key to Antigone's authenticity. Um, the fate which she accommodates herself to, this dine on which she chooses to suffer is death. Antigone recognizes the necessity of death to life, or in other words, the necessity of concealment to being. Um, and this, I think, really comes across in a particular passage from, uh, from the lecture series. And here I quote, uh, what determines Antigone is that which first bestows ground and necessity upon the distinction of the dead and the priority of blood. What that is, Antigone, and that also means the poet, leaves without a name. Death and the human being, human beings and embodied life, in each case belong together. Death and blood, in each case, name different and extreme realms of human being, and being is neither fulfilled nor exhausted in the other. Heidegger continues by circling back to the poetry of Holderlin with the final lines from In Beautiful Blue. And the German is, Leben ist Tod und Tod ist auch ein Leben. So life is death and death is also life. Antigone is authentic because she intimates the near, the near inarticulable paradox of being that death is co-constitutive of life and concealment is co-constitutive of being. To use the language of being in time, Antigone is properly resolute. She is authentic. To use the language of um, being dwelling thinking, Antigone has become properly mortal. Um, and this is, um, yeah, so I'm doing okay for, for time? Okay. Uh, so in his treatment of Antigone, Heidegger also um, adopts this metaphor of the hearth, which is very important for the Greeks, of course. 
Um, and so here the hearth means basically the same as the clearing of beings, um, otherwise known as Lichtung. And as he writes about the hearth, um, and here I quote again, in all the temples of the gods and all sites of human habitation, this fire has its secure locale. And as this locale gathers around it, all that properly occurs and is bestowed. Through this fire, the hearth is determinative, is the determinative, determinative middle, the site of all sites, as it were, the homestead, pure and simple, towards which everything presence, presences alongside and together with everything else, um, in, and together with everything else, and thus first is. Heidegger con concludes this paragraph with a seemingly tangential reference to the Vestal Virgins of ancient Rome. Here I want to suggest that this image of the Vestal Virgin is a useful metaphor for thinking about Antigone. Antigone is not just a tragic hero who, like Oedipus, bravely faces her doom head on. She is a kind of priestess of being and a protector of the hearth. Significantly, she tends being precisely by attending to the dead, so in burying her brother, by taking on the cold work of caring for the dead, Antigone oh, safeguards this warmth of the hearth, the warmth of being for the sake of her community. And so now I wanna conclude with a few questions. Um, so if we're to believe Heidegger that Antigone's care for the dead, her commitment to, I mean, what we might call funerary practices, um, is a demonstration of her commitment to the law of being. How does this square with what Heidegger has to say in Being in Time about inauthentic modes of relating to death? And so for anyone who's read that section on death, um, there's kind of listed a, a bunch of more inauthentic ways of, of coping with, of um, confronting death, you know, how, how the they deals with death. So um, it's, um, so, so it's kind of death is, of course, put forth as a very sort of individual phenomena. You, you come to find your being towards death on your own. But here in this um, Antigone interpretation, at least the way I'm reading it, does seem like Antigone's um, action is, is um, sort of a bringing to light of being towards death, but in a way that's for the community, in that the community needs to be um, owning up to death together. I don't know if that makes sense. Um, and so I, I've got other questions here too. Um, is becoming mortal, properly becoming mortal, that is, an individual or a collective phenomena? And I think this changes throughout um, Heidegger's career, although, um, and, and I want to say, I want to say it's a collective phenomena. And in what ways could we support then a healthier relation to, to death within our communities? Um, and what is the relation between art, poetry, and funerary practices? And how might they all support a healthier relationship to concealment and or death? That's it. Excellent. Very good. Thank you very much. Priestess of being. Um, and yes, it is about a community of mortals. So you can already, this is a precursor to the fourfold here. Yeah. Um, writings that Heidegger, of well, the lecture courses on, <clears throat> um, on Herdelin, on, on Sophocles, and uh, circling this, this, he's already on the path to what will become the Gefield, the gathering of the four regions, which is about mortals specifically. Yes, very good. Um, if there are any questions specifically for Leah that you'd like to ask, feel free. Um, I'm already tending towards throwing the, the, letting you know about time out the window because it just kills the flow. Um, <laughs> so, you know, 
set up the form and then <laughs> kill it. So no, uh, is that there aren't any questions now? We'll just let it um, sink in. It was a wonderful talk, I find. Um, and then we continue and you can gather your thoughts and then we can have a discussion at the end. Thank you, Leah. That was excellent. Thank you for um, listening. Thank you. Who wants to go next? Who should go next? Lottery. I'll, what about, uh, I'll go next. Okay. Can you turn on your um, camera, Bruce? Yeah. So you get it all with me. See. I'm trying to find. Okay. <clears throat> my topic, uh, my topic is, uh, is Heidegger be an existentialist? Uh, <clears throat> we need to answer two further questions before answering this question. Number one, what does existence mean for Sartre? <clears throat> what does, two, what does existence mean for Heidegger? Uh, answering the first one, Sartre says in existentialism <clears throat> is a humanism, the fundamental meaning of existentialism resides in man's inability to transcend human subjectivity. And uh, quote, man is not only that which he conceives himself to be, but that which he wills himself to be. And since he conceives of himself only after he exists, just as he wills himself to be after being thrown into existence, man is nothing other than what he makes of himself. This is the first principle of existentialism. It is also what is referred to as subjectivity, unquote. It seems uh, to me that Sartre conceives of existence as the present at hand of the ego. Uh, two, answering two, what does existence mean for Heidegger? Heidegger starts with every, the everyday world and care, not with an eye. The everyday is the everyday of Dasein. Dasein is being in the world, and Dasein exists factically and always as a whole. In Heidegger's book, Basic Concept, Heidegger says, let us follow the ancient saying, Maleta ta pan, take into care, being as a whole. And in thinking being as a whole, we think what is. That is the actual, the necessary and possible. The idea of wholeness is important in philosophy. It seems to me, uh, it seems to me, because as with Kant, you get the a priori and something like the primordial. Another way to look at this wholeness is as a state of affairs or as situated. So Dasein is always situated. Uh, Heidegger, in his discussion of being in the world, talks of entering a room. He says the room is not something pieced together from items in the room. But this room or region comes first and the equipment shows up as in order to, as an in order to assignment out of a referential totality. <clears throat> I give a, <clears throat> for an example <clears throat> uh, of a room out of maybe what you would call a world is gone, a uh, cottage industry. A young lady walks to her sewing room. She opens the door, then goes to her workstation, sits and starts her work. She does not reflect on her actions as an isolated subject, but she is attuned or in a certain mood. And the work is, the work is a project, a possibility she chose or got herself into. She is always in some mood and always projecting ahead into possibilities from day to day, before work, after work, until death. And as long as we factually exist, there is also mit Dazan there with us. <clears throat> In his book, The Hermeneutics of Facticity, Heidegger says, Facticity is the designation we 
we will use for our own Dasein. The expression means, in each case, this Dasein and this being there. For a while, at a particular time, that is wildness, tearing for a while. I believe this factual existence is captured also in, in literature. Uh, I have the quote uh, of soliloquy from Shakespeare Macbeth. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded times and all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. And Heidegger, is Heidegger an existentialist? If you mean thrown into subjectivity, then no. Dasein is always in the world and Dasein is ontological and exists factually. Uh, thank you. Very good. Thank you very much, Bruce. Excellent. Did you did you have that handwritten? Yeah, I had to written. Nice. Oh, I, did I cover up my face? I'm sorry. Did I cover no, 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 no. It's just I just saw for a second. Yeah, that I had handwritten to write it out. I can't that's type. To, so that's to be applauded also. To have an essay mm -hmm. written by hand, you know, we should do more <laughs> of that. Very good. How long did it take? I have no idea. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm not checking anymore. Okay. As I said. Struck your head out the window. Um, okay. So, thank no, you very everybody. good. Very good. So, if there thank are any you. questions, Bruce, thank you very much indeed. Uh, if there are any questions, let us know now. If not, then uh, we'll just uh, push that through the end or so. Um, maybe because we're on language, Thomas, Thomas J. So, I published the, um, the essays published on Medium. So, if, everyone, if you want to follow along as I'm talking out loud, I don't have visuals this time. I didn't have time to do a slide deck <laughs> for the talk, the last, uh, last post-seminar. Uh, but yeah, I'll get started. For me, one of the most striking shifts from ancient to modern thought is where do we find the source of activity in entities? For the ancients, substances have souls or nature. That is, an inner principle is the cause of their activity. In other words, the cause of activity is internal to the subject. The change from an acorn to a tree is directed by this inner principle of activity, which is its telos or end of that tree. This notion seems quite fun on a first impression, but we today moderns would balk from the implications of this account, especially when we consider the secondary idea from internal souls that substances attract other like substances. The ancients would use this axiom to explain why a rock falls to the earth or a dog prefers a particular tile to sit on. The stone fell to the earth because they both have the same substance of earth. Fido desires to be near that title because they share some similar substance. Um, this hypothesis contrasts markedly from the notion of an external source of activity, which in modern thought has progressed over time. First, we describe the falling of a rock due to the gravitational forces of an external object called the Earth. Next, we explain the behaviors can be conditioned to external stimulus uh, with Pavlov's dogs. Third, Marx's account says that human beings' psychological, moral, and social schemas uh, result from an external material conditions. In short, this, the notion of an external source of activity progressed from inanimate objects then to sentient behavior and finally to rational activity to be explained by this external source of, of movement. Part two, technology as Castell. The question concerning technology attempts to describe technology as the reversal of the fourfold causation model provided by Aristotle. In particular, in my opinion, the final cause. Technology challenges entities not to a definite end, but instead rather to unlock energy for a undisclosed indefinite uh, purpose later in time named standing reserve. The water mill spins a wheel to grind the wheat. A power dam spins a turbine wheel to store electrical energy. The water mill's purpose is limited and definite while the power dam's purpose is unlimited and indefinite. 
entities are evaluated for utility and extracted for storage energy, either explicitly like a power dam or implicitly like an Amazon fulfillment center. This shift from limited to unlimited ends for Heidegger is the danger of technology. What is truth for Heidegger? Traditionally, the truth was an agreement between the proposition and the entities referenced. Therefore, the measure of for the truth of a statement is in this agreement. Heidegger challenges this account. I didn't include it in the essay, I ran out of time, but this is from being in time. Truth has by no means the structure of an agreement between knowing and the object in the sense of a likening of one entity, the subject, with another, the object. Paragraph 219. Instead, for Heidegger, truth is the uncovering of being as described in an account in the Logos. And this power of giving accounts is exclusive to Dasein. The Logos tells how entities comport themselves, paragraph 219. There is no truth if there is no Dasein. Dasein as constituted, cons constituted by disclosedness is essentially in truth. There is truth only in so far as Dasein is and as long as Dasein is. Paragraph 227. This would seem, it would seem reasonable to infer for Heidegger, our speech imposes onto reality how entities disclose themselves. He goes on to say, so he goes so far to say as our speech frees entities. There is no hierarchy of truth for Heidegger. All utterances both reveal and hide being in authentic and inauthentic or all mixtures of inside being and therefore truth. Dasein can uncover entities and free them, paragraph 227. When I place Heidegger's claims of the dangers of technology with this account for truth as the uncovering and freeing power exclusive to humans, I am left with a dilemma. I do not see how Heidegger can claim that there is a danger of standing reserved when by his own account, truth itself is a power of mankind only and has no external demands placed on it. If Heidegger was so concerned with the use of technology that converts all existence into a standing reserve, this would imply that entities have a internal dignity, dignity. Yet narrowing technocratic language is the problem because such a narrowing of language cuts off being and truth. When language is free, being is freed. Such a statement sounds lovely, but it is an utterance that would imply an external source of activity. If entities were to have an internal principle, then our account must reveal that principle to be the truth, which would then delimit speech. This set of claims is in contradiction between essentially, if I had summarize it, ontic and linguistic freedom. My judgment of these claims. There is a danger to technology. But on what footing can Heidegger make this claim? Danger requires something to be at stake. From my reading of Heidegger, entities cannot be let to be because there's no internal principle of activity at all. Likewise, there's no judgment by any account of being me more true than other, for they are all utterances that both reveal and hide being. If Dasein has the power of account and has no one to answer for such a power, why is man not permitted to pursue his unlimited desires? Heidegger himself claims that Dasein is always ahead of himself. Is, is this not Dasein achieving his authentic being? Both Heidegger and, I, Heidegger and I say no. Heidegger points to the they and in the inauthenticity that ignores death, which is totally fine for him to say. In fact, actually, it's one of the most important things he says about this idea. But that would require him to retract his claim of linguistic freedom because some accounts are therefore more true than others. Closing, Heidegger returned to the ancients, but his retention of the modern notion of activity weakened for him, weakened him to answer the pressing questions stemming from modern technology. He knew the dangers of his time and what would befall us from those technologies, but his ideas were not equipped to confront the call. I say this respecting the man very much and I empathize with him because I feel my circumstances today are like his own. I feel like I do not have the strength to answer the call of what today demands of us. 
I am in a dark cloud of unclear what is north and south, right or wrong, truth or falsity. What I can do is look to the past, to tradition, and seek to understand. Those who thought in the past grant us many gifts. The gift might be a mistaken notion, but we are blessed to witness, to understand, and to learn from those mistakes. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much. You may have just pointed the finger to the danger in Heidegger himself. Um, I think he was though quite aware of the danger um, and all of his dangerous project. And this question, of course, you know, how how do the how do the Greeks or well, the ancient times relate to our times? That was an old question on the continent at the time. 200 years before, 100 years before Heidegger, it's 150 years before him. It's Goethe, very good book, by the way, Goethe and the Greeks. Um, and I just say one thing, Thomas, um, to make the piece stronger, you should consider physis in Heidegger. So that would be important um, to factor in. The question of physics of self rising. Um, because there is then, it's not just purely external, I think, for him. But still, I would say, you know, he, he did point the finger too. Um, and this is something, you know, that, that when you first start reading Heidegger, you think, oh, he's, you know, he's this, he romanticizes the, the old way, etc. Actually, I don't think he does. I think he's full on modern almost sometimes postmodern, you could say, um, and tries to come somehow come up with a, a way out. Um, but yeah. Is there, are there any questions or comments on this one for now? Uh, yeah, Bruce? I don't have a question. I just wanted to point out something about uh, freedom. I, I think a good essay to, re re to read and so you can understand what Heidegger means by freedom. It's on the uh, essence of ground. Uh, and he talks about the, the ground is strewn threefold way. And uh, I think freedom for him is shifting, uh, 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 establishing ground. So it's a really difficult essay, but if you read that, because he didn't mean the regular thing about freedom. I mean, uh, so freedom is something different. I think he got it from hurdling. Okay, that, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Yeah, very good. I think that's important to mention also. Um, this, so I think Leo's talk would be uh, good here if Professor Harrington were ready for the occasion. I think you mute, Professor. Professor Harrington. You're still mute. Okay. Now, 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 your, cam now your camera's off. There we go. I, 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 I'm I set up in a different room, so I'm walking there now. <laughs> but yeah, the yeah, the, okay, the, yeah, the, 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 the title of, of my talk is uh, The Danger and uh, Thesis and Thesis. Okay, The Danger, Physis and Thesis. Near the end of Heidegger's essay, The Danger, he introduces the dichotomy, physis, thesis. Near the start of that essay, he writes, world and positionality are the same. They are differently the essence of being. World is the guardian of the essence of being. Positionality is the complete forgetting of the truth of being. In this presentation, we would like to present a view for seeing world and Gestell positionality as the same. World, vices, is emergence from what is inside itself. Gestell, thesis, is submergence into what is outside itself. And we would like to suggest a way of viewing physis and thesis as innately paired. As such, the danger is simply that the future delivers the necessity of thesis to the present 
before the future's delivery of the possibilities of physis and ecstatic moments has had sufficient effect. To start, uh, first, a review of the central issue of being and time. Uh, okay, review, review. Um, facticity is given as thrown possibilities, uh, verf. Further throws are given as either and verf, which will denote by capital E, uh, those possibilities that do not contradict the understanding. So capital so E is the basis of the understanding's projects. So further throws are given either as that or they are given in ecstatic moments as null basis, disclosure D, where E and D are disjoint having no possibilities in common. Thus the D discloses that the needed basis that the understanding is demanding, cap capital E, you know, is, is null if the facticity really is going the way that capital D is saying. Okay. Um, In ecstatic temporality, Zuconan, the future, delivers a null basis disclosure to facticity, which speaks through stim, stim being the root, voice. If anxiety is spoken, then the end verb E is abandoned. The old understanding is abandoned, and the disclosure D is embraced. This is how thesis operates. Now, admittedly, I'm interpreting Heidegger here. So, you know, you're free to interpret him your way. I'm free to interpret him my way. <laughs> okay. Um, the future knows D as a null basis for E since this is just the working out of the logical contradiction from E and D together. E and D are disjoint. There's no possibility residing in both. So a series of logical entanglements. But those entanglements also correspond to a series of causal effects working themselves out over time. So in the fullness of time, the future is also delivering this situation to the present. And the, uh, the logical entanglements you know, can be huge, huge billions, trillions, quadrillions of, of, of connections, usually summarized almost at once by an induction or something. And the causal entanglements are similar things. You know? So the Yeats quote from the uh, poem, uh, The Second Coming seemed appropriate. And now I know the 20 centuries of stony sleep were vexed to nightmare by a rocking cradle these causal entanglements going on and on. And what rough beast, its hour come now round at last, is slouching its way toward Bethlehem to be born. The fact that we are actually on disjoint facticities. The corresponding scenario is when facticity does not speak anxiety, but the null basis status of D and E is delivered to the present. In this case, E is affirmed. No anxiety, no need to abandon your old understanding. E is affirmed and D is rejected. This is how thesis operates. And by affirming the old understanding, and having in your hand an absolute contradiction to what D is means that if E, the understanding of E has the upper hand, D gets obliterated. To help distinguish notationally physis and thesis, we will use E and D when anxiety is spoken to the inverse, 
the case of physis, and will use epsilon and delta when anxiety is not spoken, the case of thesis. Now, consider the situation of two understandings, of two daci. Call one of these adverbs E and the other epsilon. The two decilon can each have very different understandings, but they presume that they are together in facticity. Namely, they presume they are in a possibility in common to E and epsilon. But if E and epsilon are incomparable, uh, are disjoint, the future knows it by logical entailment and delivers this situation to each of the two understandings. And so we have the one facticity speaking of this one situation, but speaking to the two understandings. The coordination of physis and thesis occurs when facticity speaks anxiety to one of these enterers, say to E, but not to the other, say non-anxiety is spoken to epsilon. Then over time, the future is calling through anxiety for E to be abandoned and for epsilon to be embraced. So the call of physis. Until this situation is delivered to the present, where the non anxiety speaking to epsilon calls for epsilon to be affirmed and E rejected. Assuming chair arranges for facticity to choose to speak. Anxiety is on one side, but not the other. Then, when the present arrives, physis and thesis will be precisely in accord as identical. So, the true danger is ignoring anxiety and acting with thesis when physis was called for. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much, Professor Harrington. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> could, could we could we see you again? If oh, we... I, I don't know. Sure, I'll just pick the thing up. Right? Ta -da! <laughs> yes, yes, very good. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any questions or comments? Which essay is that? That's the danger you say? Uh, yeah, in the English translation, the danger, uh, Gaffar, I think. Is that right, Johannes? What, yes, what can Gaffar. I find it? Maybe I already have it. What can I find it? Uh, oh, Johannes? I, you know, it's, it's that, that uh, volume with a strange name. Uh, um, <laughs> uh, it's, uh, you find it, it's, so it's recently been translated by Andrew Mitchell. And you will find it in the Bremen and Freiburg talks. Oh, okay, I have that. Okay. It, oh, yeah, okay. it's in the it's in the Bremer talks, the talks he gave okay. in Bremen. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. <laughs> Leah, do you have a question? Yes. Yeah. Um. I thought it. Um. Yeah. I, you. You kind of. Um. Named two different modes of disclosure. And and when I um, read Being in Time a while ago, I was certainly thinking along those terms, there being two modes of disclosure, one that was um, aggressive, sort of, I mean, or challenging, and one that was more receptive. Um, and, and one thing that really struck me when I was read, when I read Being in Time was that, that resoluteness um, had the same root in German as um, disclosure or disclosiveness. Like, so there is Ensklosenheit oh, yeah. and Ersklosenheit. And the way that um, my, my undergrad prof taught it to us is the one is into the castleness and the other one is out of the castleness. So one has the prefix where you know you're you're staying bound within your your safe fortress, and the other one you're you're you know you're putting yourself out there, um, outside of your walls and exposed um, to the world. And so I mean it's I can't remember actually which one it is, Entor, Air, but but um, but 
The, the idea was that when you're in this more receptive mode, the mode that you called phusis, um, you're, you're outside of your walls, um, you're, you're defenseless. Whereas um, this sort of thesis mode that you've called, this is the one where you, you remain within your, um, your, your fortress where you're safe, you know, the, yeah. the close. Mm -hmm. That's, and that's, that's the distinction. When, it, when anxiety presents itself, you're called to leave your castle. Yeah. When, when yeah. non-anxiety calls, you're, you're, you're staying in your castle. <laughs> yeah. Although, I mean, who's to say which comes first? Sometimes you leave the castle and then you feel anxious, or sometimes you get a twinge of anxiety and it calls you to leave the castle. But, yeah. <laughs> well, 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 I mean, one Im image that uh, my... my presentation was trying to suggest is, you know, suppose there actually is a reality of the fact that we actually are not together. Our understandings actually put us in play, you know, then our, our sense of the ground we're on is totally separate. So it's like two people close to each other, but they're totally separate. How do they get together? One way is one stands still and the other takes the step over. Yeah, the whole or, idea of communication doesn't work if we're only if we're all staying in our castles all the time right so um, so, so the, the the presentation i have you know is simply if you are receiving the call of anxiety go out of your castle and step toward it but if you're not wait stay in their castle and open the door <laughs> because the other guy might be feeling anxiety and about to step through yeah mm -hmm. Anyway, thank you. I think my um, my etymologies are really like not accurate, but it's been it's been a useful <laughs> image for me. Are are, are they thank accurate, Johanna? I just should seen that. <laughs> well, which well, one? Just... Which one's of the many? Leah, what, what do you mean? Which one is? Do you think is not accurate? Or which one? Oh, just um, so the air close and height. And Schlossen height with the, yeah. I mean, I know Schlossen is sort of locked. No, yeah, 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 it's locked. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. But so I don't I, know if it, I, if it was intentional on Heidegger's part. Well, I mean, it probably was. He was aware. He was aware of the roots. Um, yeah. I just, you know, I had one prof express express doubts um, about that way of thinking of it in terms of a castle or fortress. Um, <sighs> No, because I think in a very, so you could almost in a, uh, a strict structural reading of being in time, you could say that when, when we get to Entschlossenheit, which is in English, re resoluteness, right? And it sounds like Dasein oh. is running around like a homunculus doing something, to which Heidegger <laughs> responds, as you know, two years later, it never occurred to me to describe Dasein and its life world taking the tram and <laughs> using fork and knife to eat. Um, so... Uh, he, and so in a you know a, let's say almost autistic structural reading of this the minute we get to Entschlossenheit Dasein itself stands utterly unlocked in front of its own self um, diagnosis which is what the text is Dasein gets to know itself in being in time right this, this is why it's not this is like Reading Khan and saying whether well, he you know he contradicts himself here and there, back and forth in the first critique. Uh, same with Heidegger. He said that so the obvious developmental texts. Uh, you cannot say everything from the beginning. Um, and the rest of what's usually resoluteness is when Dasein is unlocked, discovered, disclosed, um, with its own closures, of course, at the same time coming in too. Um, so I would uh, and and Schloss. Of course, you know, his castle. Uh, you could, you could <laughs> say that. Um, but a, a, or a fortress, and a fortress is blocked up to a certain degree, but as such visible, but right? it's visible as closed off. Um, so very good discussion, very briefly. And um, I shouldn't be speaking anyways. Well, who was first? Was it Lou or Thomas? Oh. The other one? So Thomas? And then Lou? No, actually, it was Lou first, then me. Oh, I got confused here. Yeah. Yeah, Didn't know who it was. Okay, Lou. Yeah, just on this. Uh, um, I, I just looked it up while, while you're talking. So the, the English word fortress comes, of course, from 
uh, Fortis Latin. And I didn't know this until I just looked it up now, but uh, that original meaning for Fortis just means strength. But the speculation of the etymology going back to Indo-European is to rise, that which arises or that which is high or that or, or, a, or the word for a hill. So this notion of being locked up, but being visible and perhaps rising is there even in the Indo-European. Um, so that was just interesting to, to find out. Um, good, I mean, this is what, I think this is more, what I take at least from Heidegger's uh, quote unquote etymology is they're not rigorous philological exercises to show you exactly the meaning of the word. They are in part attempts to break up how you hear a word now and it doesn't really resonate for you, kind of like another great uh, thing that Leah mentioned uh, earlier in the course about hearing lines and plays that don't have any resonance for you. you've heard them so many times. So in that same way, hearing a word in a, in a way, even if the etymology might be totally like spurious. Anyway, uh, the other thing I wanted to say is that uh, it's interesting this, yeah, this unlock or this locked in, this resoluteness, um, I wonder, Leo, what you think about the equa primordiality of mitzain, of being with, uh, of dasein, that it is always already with others and doesn't need to go out and reach them. And I see this as Heidegger trying to walk a tightrope, right, between sort of Hegel's, the I is, the, is a we, so that kind of sociality, while also acknowledging in things like death or radical individuatedness. Um, so I see Mitzayn is perhaps just by fiat <laughs> trying to, to, to walk that, that fine line. But I, I wonder, because that to me runs somewhat in tension this notion of, of us being closed in any super essential way um, when we come into contact with one another. Oh, yeah. So uh, yeah, for me, I guess Mitzayn takes me to Division One, Chapter 4. You know where that leads into to Das Mann and things, but it also uh, like a lot of things for me, it then reverberates about the beginning of Division One, Chapter Five, where that thing about the subject-object relationship you know, must be secured, the phenomenon must be secured, and, and so the primordial thing is more or less the, the with sign of subject-object. You know, there's some, there's this this when I try to think about it mathematically, there's this thing which like a, a, it's, a, it's secured. And in there is, you know, the, the togetherness and the distinction between, you know, I, you, and so on. It's just kind of dancing around there. The I and you dance around at that point. And then later Heidegger, all four of them are dancing around. But you're, you're securing the phenomenon of the kind of connections that, that, uh, chapter four is uh, mid sign would you know be the first kind of re reference to in dean time so <laughs> very good uh, thomas a question and then we'll oh. move on okay let's do this okay leah could you have something on this yeah for lou okay um, can we pause that because we do want to get to let's have okay you remember that do we have anyone else speak <laughs> and then we have a discussion afterwards Thomas, this is a question for Leo. Yeah, very quickly. Just your thoughts yeah. and meditation on the calling or con or the conscience of of Dazan. Just I thought about that. Just, I, in response to the anxiety, right? So just I thought of that. You mean you mean the, the call the call conscious? Like the idea that the, basically this idea, like what I'm understanding, is a lot of this thesis notion, right? Done, by, done, produced by the individual, right? So I was just meditating on just parts of being in time where he talks about. Um, Dasein's calling, right, or the or consciousness, so the conscience yeah. of the of the subject, just meds just floating up here. Oh, well, again, again for, for me, the way my mind works, you know that that's again second second chapter of Division Two, and for me, I think it's section fifty eight, where again it's you know spelled out that that the the understanding has the basis that it needs that actually supports the the distinction that is its understanding. And then the, the null basis is the fact that that's a restriction of facticity. And, you know, it can be, you know, from, from my mathematical mind, it just means it can be wrong. 
you know, it's 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 standing in its castle and there's stuff outside the castle. So that that and that's the that's where basically the call of conscience is to my mind, um, from my kind of mind, most clearly explained. Very good. I mean, touched very briefly. Um, the Heidegger says somewhere that the one of the maybe not one that language is märchenhaft, <laughs> which is is you know is of a fairy tale. So. Mm. I'll just throw that in. You know, you like that, Harrington. Oh. It's not Harrington. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, it, it was, often it, I've heard from you, this is just how my mind works, and I never know what you mean. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, we'll come back. So, I've made a note that Leah wants to uh, comment or question, lose something. We'll do this in the end, but I do want to give everyone else a chance to, to give their talk. So, maybe um, Beate, no, she's not here. Uh, she will come back. Check. Maybe you, you grant us your Aufriss, if this is what you're still <laughs> indeed speaking about, your uh, a tearing, little bit, tearing yes. open. So, yeah, thank you. Um, so this is, uh, my essay is called Reflections on Heidegger's yep. Approach to Language as Praxis for Thinking and Writing. Okay. So Heidegger believes a new approach to language is needed. He both explains the new approach in writing such as The Way to Language, and he, and he shows us this new approach to language, that is he demonstrates and enacts it through the process of thinking and writing a text, with the most concentrated enactment occurring in the contributions to philosophy of Ereignis. This essay is an initial consideration of Heidegger's methods of languaging language as the foundation for developing a praxis of thinking and writing. First, what is the nature of Heidegger's project? In the way to language, he states, quote, we are here undertaking something very unusual, which we may paraphrase as follows. We try to speak about speech qua speech. Heidegger contrasts this approach to previous efforts by rejecting the elaboration of, quote, general notions about language, such as energy, activity, labor, power of spirit, worldview, or expression, under which to subsume language as a special case. He believes that such methods based on forms of conceptualization run away from language. Instead, he sets off to develop new and at sometimes more originary forms of thinking to reflect on language from within language to allow language to be experienced as language. In this project he faces, as we all face, a problem because we think primarily through language, language sets the bounds of our thinking. Words of a language, among other things, point to things outside of themselves. Thus, to use language to describe and explain the experience of language can form recursive loops in which the originary experience of language continually recedes behind the always next layer of words. To paraphrase a well-known known saying, it's words all the way down. On first glance, there appears to be no escape from the prison of language for the thinker of language. Heidegger's approach therefore requires a more poetic, discursive, originary, redefining and enactive approach, a way to continue to use language for there is no escape from it in less restrictive ways. In the way to language, Heidegger makes three initial moves to point our way. First, he tells us that Quote, to say means to show, to let appear, to let be seen and heard. Second, he characterizes the role of the human thinker and speaker thusly, quote, we dare not attribute showing either exclusively or definitively to human doing. Self-showing as appearing characterizes the coming to presence or withdrawal to absence of every manner and degree of thing present. Even when showing is accomplished by means of our saying, such showing or referring is preceded by a thing's letting itself be shown, close quote. And third, Heidegger tells us that meaning is multitudinous. To gain a deeper understanding is to reject words as merely signs that designate a thing that, uh, that already hold it in place, and instead to consider what he calls the alphris, the rift design, 
a type of drawing or plan or blueprint that appears from the rift in the world that shows itself and does so in its totality. The rift design redefines language as not foremost a concept, but rather a web of relatedness among words and among words and things that is opened in and expressed by this rift design and it is always in access of any concept. Given Heidegger's understanding of language as firstly the showing of things and of uh, humans as the clearing or sight of language, the question arises, how can the human thinker and writer become a better sight for languaging? After all, just as we are Dasein, a being there, we are a languaging there. What follows is my way of organizing the sources of languaging in some ways to greater fertility of thinking. At the center of the scream is the narrative, the text, the actual words used and the order in which they are placed in the process of thinking and writing. The text is the outcome, the artifact. So how is it arrived at? How is it that these words appear and not others? And what and how do they show? and not show. I present four sources of new ways of thinking that result in the text. The morphemologic element, the non-signifying sign element, the story element, and the beyond story element. The morphemologic element. At the heart of Heidegger's project to loosen the tight bonds of words as signs, and to instead consider the totality of meanings as aphoris, is his exploration of the morphemes of language. Morphemes are the smallest unit of meaning carried by language. They comprise the roots of words that are usually encumbered by affixes, that is by prefixes and suffixes. Heidegger, in order to avoid a one-to-one -one relationship between word and thing, will use a constellation of words. The totality of meaning is carried by all versions and instances of that word. Examples include versions of the word, that's the, the basis of Alfres, by the way, is der is, meaning a crack or rift. And the versions he uses in his writings include Alfres, Abres, Umres, and Grundres. Another example is the grouping of words derived from Stellen, such as Vorgestellt, uh, hergestellt and nicht verstellen. And still another example is based on the root Grund, such as Abgrund, Ungrund, Urgrund. So other morphological, um, I'm sorry, morphemologic methods uh, Heidegger uses to complexify the meaning of words is to, one, add hyphens to words, such as to Abgrund, Da, Sein, Er, Eignis, and then to explore the change in meaning that the gap of the hyphen eventuates. Two, to change the spelling of words, such as shifting from sign to sign with a Y. Three, to create neologisms, partly through new and uncommon combinations of root morphemes with affixes, often multiple ones in the same word. And four, to add the eth 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 etymological dimension to words, that have become lost or weathered down through time. One example already used is the relationship of speaking to showing. This morphologically complexifying approach to language brings to mind a metaphor, that of Indra's jewels, as first expressed in the Atarva Veda. The great god Indra forms an infinite net of cords with a multifaceted jewel at each meeting of the cords. The jewels reflect each other upon their faces in infinitely recursive reflections, thus capturing the idea of the interconnectedness and interpenetration of everything in the universe in ways analogous to Heidegger's interconnected and interpenetrating webs of meaning. Next is the non-signifying uh, sign element. Although Heidegger insists that words are more than signs with simple reference, they are nonetheless signs, but not only signs. Among other aspects, signs always include a non-signifying element, a part that does not point to anything outside of itself. This aspect of language is especially important in poetry, song, and oration. The aspects of spoken words that are non-signifying elements include their sound, 
the harshness or melodiousness of their sound, the way they can be rhymed, their alliterativeness, their shortness and simplicity versus their length and complexity. The importance of this aspect of language is how different connections between words that are unrelated in meaning or etymology are formed in different languages, surely by virtue of which words rhyme or alliterate together in a particular language. Thus, every language leads their speakers to certain predispositions to word and thus to idea associations. A telling example is Heidegger's approach, I'm sorry, Heidegger's appropriation of the term ad agnes. As Niederhauser, 2021, his first name, first initial is J, by the way, points out, ad agnes, a form of ad agnen, originates from the words uh, eroigen, meaning to, at the word, from the word eroigen, meaning to look or peer towards. Over time, the oi sound softened to i and then was confused the word with the word eigen, to own. Heidegger does not, however, reject this errancy that occurred over time and instead incorporates both meanings in his word eigenness as an anoning event. So this is one of the most stunning aspects of Heidegger for me. He basically, this is, he, he comes up with a term with a, a, a very complex meaning based on the non-signifying sign elements of these two words that just became confused over, over centuries of usage. Next is the story element. One aspect of language that was clarified by linguists and literary theorists was the distinction between the narrative, that is the text, and the story. The narrative is the expression, the outcome of a story that is both less and more than a story. Every form of thinking and writing needs to take on a form which structures and makes intelligible what is written. However, these structures of narrative become conventions and capture the thought or writing to the detriment of what is trying to show to be said. For example, a writer of screenplays who has read too many books on screenwriting may do damage to his characters and scenes through hewing to a pre-approved structure. The same may occur with conceptual thinking in which the writer's conceptual thoughts take on pre-existing forms of metaphysical concepts. And the last element is the beyond story element. There still must be more to thinking and writing, something beyond what is trying to be said or shown. Consider a fictional story. It occurs to certain people moving through certain events. But the, story, but the story told is but one furrow plowed into a much larger firmament. Consider taking on the eye of a hawk, flying high above a vast landscape of hills and forests and streams. As time passes and you fly across this landscape, you eye a town with streets, houses, cars, and people. You swoop down to see your protagonist. You, you must ask as you speak to this protagonist, why you, why here? Why in these events? Uh, why with these others? The same holds through for conceptual thinking and writing. Why this? Why this way? Why from this starting point and to what end? Beyond any narrative and any story is this vast landscape of possibility. One offering inexhaustible occasions for, new th for thinking anew. And even beyond this landscape, beyond the domes of the sky and the ring of the mountains that bound this cosmos is the nothingness, the generative, the, uh, the generative abyss from which all being flows. In the deepest recesses of the thinker, this realization of the non-story, of the impossibility of all stories in some form must exist. The end. Il film. Parfait. Excellent. You can hear the silence. <laughs> it's, it's, the, si yeah. the silence is part of the alphabet, right? Yeah, no, it's, <laughs> yeah, you, you, that was quite some alphabet. <laughs> Very good. Um, Lou, this is a hand up. Yeah, Lou. Just very briefly, that was, that was so great. 
Jack. Um, I don't have anything uh, in prose to say, but I just want to read a very brief six line poem from Tennyson, because you mentioned this image of, 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 the, of the eagle. So this is called The Eagle by Tennyson. He clasps the crag with crooked hands, close to the sun in lonely lands. Ringed with the azure world, he stands. The wrinkled sea beneath him crawls. He watches from his mountain walls and like a thunderbolt, he falls. It's one of my favorite short English poems. Thank you very much, Lou. Are there any more questions? I think everyone's just uh, um, pondering at the moment. I'm very moved by Czech's words. So thank you very much, Czech. Beate, why don't you go next? Yeah, I can go next. Thank you. I have a text that came to me. Yeah. Maybe it fits quite well after Jack, I have the feeling. <laughs> it's not a fiction. <laughs> um, everything is true, happened. The woman in the perfume shop. So I'm, I'm just reading it. It's, it's a reading text, about 10 minutes, yeah. Yeah, take your time. The woman in the perfume shop explaining to me that all the perfumes she sells are open scents, as in opposition to synthetic ones who are closed and so only have one layer of smell that is fixed and smells the same everywhere, in any situation, and on anybody. Synthetic scents block and encapsulate a smell so it becomes resistant to mix with, one, with any other. Natural scents in comparison can unfold in many directions. They are sending off rays that interpenetrate all different dimensions of a sphere and so are continuously subject to change. Heidegger, who happened to be in the same shop, sitting on the chair in the corner, was briefly looking up from his notebook. I had a dream where I was watering words like one would water plants. They were very dry and already crumbled like dried out leaves that would break easily and fall apart when you touch them. There were no specific words, lying somewhere on the floor like bricks or sheets of paper next to each other. Little dried out sculptures faded in color. <clears throat> in the dream, watering them was the most common thing to do. Isabel salzte nach, aber es schmeckte ohnehin niemand mehr etwas. It spoke from the radio. Isabel added salt, but nobody was able to taste anything, no more anyhow. People could vote for the best first sentence for a novel about the times of the corona pan epidemic. I felt an itch in the stomach. I thought that sentence was way too good to be given away to introduce a corona novel only. It was literally spilling over the borders of any line drawing of events of fine lining, beginnings and endings to wrap them in boxes on a lonely time scale. The conversations about meat, trying to hold apart the difference between meat that still has residues of a happy animal and meat that comes from stacked meat machines piled and stuffed on top of each other, connected to tubes where hormones come in to make them grow more. Yes, but it still tastes good and it didn't kill us yet. We got so old, nevertheless, someone keeps repeating. A piece of meat narr narrating itself through space time, laying bare the abyss. Just add a little salt. I had to think of that morning when I was looking for my mobile phone and couldn't find it. 
because it literally had become invisible on the black and shiny surface of the bed frame. It perfectly blended in two surfaces, fused together in perfect harmony, makes at least one of them invisible. As the word flattens, the same happens to people. They blend into each other and with their, with their backgrounds, foreground collapsing into background and they become invisible. Some animals only become prey when they start moving because that's when they become visible to their predators. In the GDR, for example, where I was born, former socialist East Germany, this was the most common survival strategy. The more you blended in, the better. What may have started as a strategy quickly became mere gestell. Later it became impossible to tell the difference as a strategy and gestell were merging. Strategy somehow became invisible. Isabel added salt, but nobody was able to taste anything no more anyhow. In another dream, there was this huge round black object that was stuck on my body. I went into the garden to throw it off me. It fell on some ground that was covered in black sand or dust. And when it landed, it stirred up a big cloud of something that looked like fungi spur spurs. From the distance, I saw it had, a big, it had big feathers and that covered his round body. There was no head. When the sun fell on its black feathers, a vast array of colors shimmered through. Dark greens and blue tones into deep violet. From another angle, a red and purple yellowish gloomy shimmer. It was beautiful as it just lay there, totally still on its ground. It didn't show any movement of its own that was visible to the eye, but still I panicked when it was stuck on my body in the first place. It had an aura of immense grace, of unfathomable density, where that of a stone is only a far pre preliminary stage. At the same time, it had the delicacy of, and softness of a bird. It felt a bit close off, not easily accessible, at all, but indefinitely permeable and porous. Nothing of imaginable existence could ever hurt or destroy it. It had deepest mystery to it, but it didn't feel dangerous, very old and deeply calm. It was as if the mountain range of being had incarnated and landed. There would be nothing in the world that could blend into it or with it and make it become invisible. Still, its concealment was utterly inexhaustible. A little boy while waiting for the train telling his dad, when I look at my phone, I see what's on the screen and when I switch it off, I can see myself. I was happy for him that he had found some channel to take a look at the world outside of the phone. Standing in front of the mirror as my younger self in a dance class. It was never myself that I would see staring back at me. For becoming the image in the mirror, I had to leave my body. Who then was moving it? While me was absent, something plugged into the system, downloading random postures and shapes, copy and paste. My body and the images merging, blending in, foreground collapsing into background. Me, swallowed by a machine that is invisible to the human eye and hardly to be traced by any of the human senses. I watched the boy's finger gliding over the screen of his phone. Today, the word scroll tiefe, scrolling depth, came out of the radio as a reference point of, for measuring attention value for a website. Suddenly hundreds of bodies dressed in black and orange came out of holes like a swarm of ants scattering all over the streets. 
People pressed some buttons on their screen and the finger of the boy ordered a hamburger. This weird eeriness of things. You minimize distances at one point of space, flattening the world to your demand, but at some other point, space pops open, stuff is spilling over. There's a weird resistance of stuff to flattening. If you were ever fighting ants in your living space, you know if you plug one hole, even more of them come invading at some other point. Gives me a deep relaxation and trust in the universe. I feel energy coming back to my body. Nothing, it, nothing is just vanishing or simply disappearing. Things have a power that we hardly have any access to. How come, as the world flattens, huge round black feathered beings still land in our dreams? Where do they come from? How do they find their way through deep space? Writing this text, I notice how it literally got invaded by things that were gathering in the space around me in the last few weeks. None of them I made up, they somehow appeared where did they come from? How did they find their way here and started speaking to me? How did they enter my awareness? I surely didn't go into the perfume shop to look for them. This somehow happened. But didn't, didn't just happen either. Would they have happened if I hadn't happened to be there? How did they take shape in the realm that I became part of with my gaze and my being there? And who or what was gazing through me, out of me? Like a word that arises of the deep architecture of language and leaves, and leaves or blossoms unfold out of a tree, my gaze becomes a place where things gather and appear, suddenly unfold and break open from just lingering. My gaze is the gathering of a whole architecture of things, a certain constellation of things that I was brought into, but as well brought myself into. A constellation I am as well consciously nourishing like a gardener, and that becomes utterly unique to only me. Paths that I walked, people I met, texts that I read, and everything that contributed to that happening. Technology, money, ants, the air, my hands, the woman at the counter, the asphalt on the streets. It's a myriad of things, but for a gathering to happen, I have to hold myself in a certain space and position. Then an Ereignis, as I understand it, can pop open out of so many pores of the world. Maybe it doesn't always have to be in the form of an apocalypse that we are able to recognize it as such. I guess they can be really tiny, but it seems the flatter the world becomes, the bigger the Ereignis naturally has to become to make itself visible, to be seen. In a flat world, they otherwise hardly have a chance to appear because there would be no path for them to go and so no way for them to appear other than in the form of an explosion. Thank you. That was divine. <laughs> Thank you very much. Excellent. Really good. Are there? Are there any questions, comments, are we? No. Okay, we'll come back to it perhaps. Thank you very much, Piazza, it was wonderful. Tonatiud, here's a joke. Lest we forget. Yes, okay. uh, for, for context, uh, last proseminar on German idealism, uh, the theme of my uh, of my presentation was the act of forgetting to learn. And, and this is a continuation of that. And I know this is risky because uh, most uh, sequels are terrible. So I, I hope this is not the case. So, uh, so let's see. Uh, 
the act of forgetting to electric boogaloo, basically. Uh, so, on forgetting and concealment. Um, to speed run a summary of this course, Heidegger begins his philosophical project from being and time onward with the preoccupation of the forgetting of being and the loss of access to the world. First, pointing to those annoying salesmen known as the sophist, then responding to Descartes' proposition, cogito ergo sum, in the latter years, uh, dissecting positionality, gestell in the realm of technology. It appears that being remains trapped and just when it finds its way out, falls into a different foxhole. Uh, even Heidegger seems to admit to it when he says, where de is danger also the sa uh, is the saving power? Not just because we can invert the phrase and say that where the salvation lays, so does the danger, but because we can see both of these at the same time. With no danger, there is no salvation. Being needs to get itself in trouble in order to be rescued, to think and respond to its call. And so forgetting is not only unavoidable, but necessary. Being is not completely accessible to us in an immediate and apparent way. Nature likes to hide itself, as Heraclitus says. So every attempt at thinking re reveals, but it also does not remain permanent revealing. Let's go back to the sophist. They were not idiots or cynical conmen, but still annoying. Some, like Gorgias, responded to a serious attempt to think by Parmenides, but this massive idea became concealed to them and led to the denial of access to the world. Sino would not become a sophist, but uh, his thinking would become impossible uh, to understand the world. Other disciples of the first philosophers would end up even worse. Let's not forget our old friend, Kratilos. In thinking and writing, there is a process of loss. The words need to be transmitted, but we do not find the points in time where they are thought originally anymore. We do not speak the language as a mother tongue, and if we adopt their words as our own, the, subtl the subtlest begin to fade. As Holder Holderlin says, words are like flowers, and if you follow the life cycle of a flower, you know that the moment they bloom, they begin to wither and die. To deny this process does not give you a perennial flower, but an inert, inert buds that does not come into its own. Precisely because their death is contained in their blooming, in the same manner the forgetfulness is contained in, in thinking. To deny the process, to avoid forgetting, is to ossify the thinking contained in the language. To eliminate forgetfulness, is it would be necessary not just to store what has been written, but to take apart every word, to extract whatever meaning is possible, remove every ambigu ambiguity, and get direct correspondence one to one of the things said to an understandable equivalent. To turn what is being said to information always at hand, this would turn every thought, essay, or poem in a, into a clutter of concepts. It would homogenize the experience of thinking and would make it, its readings a passive experience, while noise that drowns any silence that forces more reflection. If we ha have a way of thinking being such a way that not only is completely transmittable with zero losses, but could be com complete to every possible context, we would not be able to access being since the need of, of thinking would cease. Unfortunately, in this case, the memorials can save us either, just as himself it would leave, leave us paralyzed. In this incompleteness that gives the need of disclosing, we get to this back and forth of disclosing and then forgetting. Since this incompleteness is not a pre-made process with the results already established in advance, also prevents us from going backward, backwards and leave, leave all new thinking behind. Forgetting it, forgetting it were a uniform predictable process would be easy to reverse. Ah, we lost this aspect of being. Control C a couple of times and done. A more complete understanding. Go to the previous version when ancient Greek was the common language and computers still did not mediate it or world. Forgetting is a process of concealing of what was once thought, but is not a negation of thinking. The thinking when is forgotten is not being unthought to re-emerge as the same. So this back and forth is not a circle, it's more of a spiral. 
and even with this image, we see already thinking turning into a representations. Ah, it's a spiral. And you imagine the shape and in your head and you draw it in a notebook. This alone, if repeated, loses any meaning, forcing, forcing it to be thought again. Forgetting keeps thinking active, keeps, keeps it attentive to the silent call of being. This way it acts as the shelter where thinking retrieves itself in a similar way as death for humans. Accepting that or thinking has to be forgotten is just as important as accepting that we are mortal. The birth of humans gives birth to death and the, the thinking of humans gives place to forgetting. The call of being to think arrives from the future thanks to forgetting, the forgetting of thought. Disclosing more as the same it time it hides from us and gives us the need to bring Alethea on concealment or probably unforgetting, but not remembering, as I said, is not something you lose and then retrieve intact. And on that note, we need to remember that this is a process closely associated with death, according to the ancient Greeks. When the dead arrived to Hades, they had a drink of the lesser river and forgot their lives. There is an intuition that in the retrieving of being, goes together with the retrieving of thinking. The act of forgetting is also a small mountain range in its own right that brings forth the dangers of destruction of being. And these dangers are not minor, are not a minor matter. People are turning into automaton. The atom bomb is detonated. Even wine is not exempt to be corrupted. Austrian wine, ma wine makers poison their product with antifreeze when we are not looking. At the same time, give philosophy relevant and call upon humans to respond to the danger and answer in a thoughtful manner. Then thought forgetting this turns into a thoughtlessness and the process starts again. A shelter is not a place of perpetual dwelling that never allows to come out. It's, an on it's not an underground nuclear bunker. It's, it still allows us to move forward but accepting our limitations as humans. I'm tempted to condense this idea in dog Latin, just as when Heidegger replied to Descartes, sum moribundans, perhaps a small echo follow that says sum oblivis. Thank you. Excellent. Very good to know. Thank you very much. It's a very good continuation of your work this year. De nada. That much I know. Speaking of wine, you know. Um, so, there are, are there any questions for Denatu or comments? If there aren't any at the moment, then of course we come back to Leah. And Leah, your question to Lou. Um, I guess. Uh... Lou uh, had a question about mid sign and how that sort of fits into my my image of the, this fortress that I mentioned before. And I guess I like I don't have a complete answer. Um, it, um, in my reading of being in time, I certainly thought of these two modes of disclosure and Sklosenheit and um, Sklosenheit as being connected to um, what was translated as uh, leaping ahead and leaping in. And one is, um, I mean, I was described to me as a more authentic way of being with others than the other. The one you're, I mean, you're treating the other as an object, projecting your own sort of ends onto them as opposed to this other mode where you're, you're with them and you, you sort of think through um, their possibilities with them. It's more of sort of an, I guess, I think of it sort of as like an identific identification. Um, so yeah, I think, I think in my mind, those two types of disclosure are connected in that maybe leaping in versus uh, leaping ahead are those modes of disclosure applied to a being with. Um, and then it just sort of occurred to me now, and it's sort of an under underdeveloped thought that um, that our being with is not something that is immediately self-evident. I think we have to unlock our Dasein before we really appreciate the way we are being with others, the way that our, our possibilities, our 
ones that are handed down by the generations. I think that's not a thought that we can think insofar as we are thinking um, in a subject object mode or thinking in terms of um, the, the atomized subject, right? So I think that being with is something that is that comes to be revealed in the same way as the clearing or being, um, or I mean the clearing comes to be sort of revealed as you're going through this process of discovering what, what Dasein is. Those are all great, yeah, great points. I definitely want to think more about this. And it kind of connects a bit with uh, Th Thomas Jay's uh, talk. Uh, Thomas still here? Oh, great, okay. Um, because something that uh, in one of the things we read, uh, Heidegger's 1962 lecture on traditional and technical language, and then in other places, he talks about Dasein as a goal. And he even says that Dasein is something that human beings could perhaps lose and not have. And maybe that's what a world of Gestell uh, could be is, is humans without Dasein. But then it, it sort of raises, you know, uh, something in the vicinity of Thomas's question of, well, why should we seek Dasein? Is Dasein better than non, not human being without Dasein? Um, what is sort of maybe we want a normative framework for why, but if we if we think about that, that Dasein is not um, always the condition of the human being, then exactly what you're saying would follow that Mitzein is is, a, is an achievement or it's something that you have to work to uh, unconceal, to to make explicit in in, in your own uh, life. Um, but I'll have to think more about all of these things. Thank you, Leah. Thank you. Any more questions? Or remarks on anything? I have, I have one for Jack. Um, Daniel. You, br you briefly mentioned the hyphen, and I had, I remembered that you, the Chinaro, said in the pro seminar with us that literally everything depends on the hyphen in Heidegger <laughs> because um, the hyphen is the absolute no thing that which can never be a being that which can never be a thing and kind of like this coming something coming into language coming into word from no thingness was kind of like a, a theme in, in your talk so perhaps you, you want to say a little bit more more about that uh, well, Daniel, thank you. I mean, I, I like I like uh, you know you you know you you picking up on the hyphen, and it, it is that's you know you could almost say that that's part of the rift. You can say that there's so much space there that you could like spend a lifetime thinking just within the hyphen, right? And this is almost like it, it it's that it's that rift in in being in in which you know you could just continue. It's a generative rift in which you can continue to think new thoughts, but also in new ways. And I think, I think the, you know, I still have a hard time capturing it in words, but obviously, you know, uh, so, you know, I, I'm interested in writing and, and, and writing uh, has its own particular skills, but it's based on thinking which also has its own particular skills, but it's also based on our way of being, being in the world, engaging the world, navigating the world, um, being aware of what's present and what is not present, uh, you know, what could be, uh, what may be, um, you know, looking for those occasions uh, in which things could, could arise. And that also has its own kind of skill set. And I think it's just in a way, I mean, to simplify it like a vertical staff stack between writing, thinking, and being in our human way of being. And ultimately to be good thinkers and writers, it's like we have to become somehow more attuned. I mean, this is like a, a, a you know, a theme, you know, that Beata had and, and Leah had about becoming more attuned to 
uh, just being uh, and like pre-linguistic being, you know, before any concepts, before even any words. And um, when one book I started reading is Walter Ong, he's a linguist, and he has this book about, you know, writing versus orality and about how language changed when, when humans started writing. And even what a huge gulf that was between uh, written language and a pre-written language, an oral language, like during the time of Homer, during the time of the Vedas, during the time of the Buddha. When you read like the, the earliest writings of, of the Buddha, it's like so repetitive because it was all about, about that rhythm and the repetitiveness. And it was like, it was uh, an, an, an enacting of something, of, of being, because it, it almost had this chant-like, trance-like um, effect on, I think, connecting the human to their world. And so I think kind of part of my, my life project is trying to understand how, again, writing relates to thinking and, and both like written thinking, because writing definitely allows thinking to become more precise um, and terminology is nothing to sneeze at. It's very important in, in, in the right circumstances. But also, you know, there have to be these more uh, discursive ways of thinking and then ultimately non-discursive ways of thinking, including, and I didn't even touch on this, like visual thinking, um, among many others, right? Uh, you, can, you can diagram a lot of things. You can... It, 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 you know, kind of have imaginal thinking that could be extremely generative. And then beyond all of that is just moving through the world. And I think we lose. And by the way, I really enjoy your, you know, when you do your, your, your strolls, uh, Daniel, because I think then you are kind of, um, or at least I like to think that the stroll is part of your thinking. It's not just like Daniel could be sitting at McDonald's and talking to us. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't be the same. I think the strolling is is part of the thinking. You know what I mean? So I don't. I'm not really answering your question, but yes, I mean the the hyphen is is of extreme. I mean it's part of the abyss. The the hyphen is part of the generative abyss. You know, and then what is in the abyss? And I think, you know, we can never reach the abyss, but we can climb into that kind of more originary and non-linguistic thinking and just, and, and connecting to different ways of being in the world. Thank you very much, Shek. Are there any comments or questions on this? If there aren't any, then I'll have to say so. I mean, I've got something with this. Is there anything? Uh, on image, perhaps, or Vorstellen, of course, Heidegger attempts the imageless thinking of being, but that is to a large degree owed to philosophy itself. And Heidegger does not want to get rid of the image entirely. He's aware that the thinker needs the poet who presents images. And his poets are, for example, Hördelin and Rilke and Trach and a few others. Um, and of course, uh, Plato himself was a, a writer of myths, too, right? He wasn't just a cold philosopher. Um, but Heidegger is also a modern philosopher, so he's not completely in line, but um, with Hegel, who said that. Uh, um, when man denkt, dann muss einem hören und sehen vergehen. Yeah. When you think you have to lose your hearing and your sight. But Heidegger actually focuses on hearing. And this is what you can see with his work on language. And this is what something that Jack mentioned before also. This allowing for errancy, erring in hearing, and listening to words and then breaking them open. You know, Gestell, Gestell is, is artificial in English. It means nothing, like, just like Dasein. But Gestell is not artificial in, in Southern German vernacular. When he writes, Gstell, this is a, this is a, this is a meant, and you know, if, yeah, if Daniel is laughing because he's they still talk like that in Vienna. Um, Gstell is a, is a machine, 
It means frame, yes, but it also is, is a machine. Um, so the, the philosopher needs the poet, the poet needs the philosopher. And on the hyphen, there is a forgotten philosopher of the 20th century who also wrote a lot on Herderlin. He was a Hegelian, Bruno Liebrox from Frankfurt. Bruno Liebrox said that the hyphen between in Bewusstsein, so the English for Bewusstsein is consciousness. And consciousness in German is Bewusstsein, so conscious being, or to make it sound more English, being conscious. There is officially no hyphen between Bewusst and Sein, it's one word, as you know, the German language can very easily uh, combine words. Um, so you get the hideous examples like Straßenbahnhaltestelle, tram stop in English, which is four words in German, but two in English, but four words in one. But Bewusstsein, the hyphen, if you add the hyphen, which Bruno Liebrox did, uh, between Bewusst, Conscious, and Sein, being, that's the human being. The human being is the hyphen, who is between consciousness or being con conscious and being, and has to respond to both. I'll leave it with that, um, but there is something in the 20th century that we have to take seriously, which is this emergence or taking seriously off the hyphen, the in-between space, Heidegger explicitly called star sign the in-between, um, that we have to heed in our century perhaps also. So that would be my two cents. Are there any more yeah, Honest. Johannes, if Honest. I could, yes, if check. I could add uh, just very quickly, like um, when we were reading Heraclitus, so even in his brief, uh, you know, um, uh, fragments, um, he, the way he put words in order, you didn't, it was not clear, it was not a simple order in leading to, a, to one meaning. So you can have a one word that follows, you know, previous word that that um, associates with it, but also can associate with the word that follows it, and then that middle word both, uh, you know, kind of um, what's the word, um, you know, complexifies the the previous word as well as complexifying the the following word in a different way. So even in the way Heraclitus was putting words in order. Uh, was already complexifying the meaning. It was almost like there there might have been at least two paths of meaning from one simple phrase. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And, and that breaking, I mean... <laughs> And that's, you know, we, this is something I think we talked about last time, wasn't it? Um, as you bring up Heraclitus, you can see in Heraclitus, at least in some of the fragments that we have, that it, some, it, you know, yes, sometimes there are, there is almost like you say a subject, predicate, object, um, grammatical structure, but very often the fragments that we have don't show much of that or not none of them. None of that at all. There's no necessity for an acting subject. There's a, the language allows for um, a description of a pure occurring of, a, of an event or of a certain goings on. Um, yeah. I wonder though, I mean, there's, there's something else I wanted to come back to also with on uh, Leah's remarks to Lou before on the subject of the economy and Dasein. Um, I mean, to a certain degree, when you read Heidegger in the in Being in Time, um, the subject, or the subject object dichotomy is itself predicated on Dasein. Um, and however, I don't think that the transformation that Heidegger is after is one that is ultimately, at least what he's got in mind, I think. Um, totalizing or finalizing, but is itself momentary. So I think he's aware of the 
at least at the early Heidegger, of the subject object dichotomy, it's almost its necessity. At the same time, the, the moments there are moments where we can step out of it, but we where it simply has to be agreed that it cannot that it cannot be the one and all narrative or story, as it were. So just very briefly, um, because officially I'm not speaking tonight. So are there any more